This is the second of two videos explaining frame buffer objects. In part one, we looked at the absolute basics of how frame buffer objects are often used, and we coded up a simple example, finding and fixing a lot of the kinds of bugs that beginners are likely to encounter. And the next few videos, we'll look at some examples that use frame buffer objects, including probably these techniques. But in this video, we're going to focus in on a few of the strange details about frame buffer objects. My goal here is just to demystify things a little bit, because when you first start out, things can be a bit overwhelming. I really hate to include this part, mainly because I use Chrome, but I kind of have to. There is a formal definition of what makes frame buffer objects frame buffer complete. You can read about it here. But what it really boils down to, more or less, is this. Something is frame buffer complete if you've done everything correctly according to a special checklist. If you've missed something, you have a bug. If you didn't, you may still have a bug, but it's not a frame buffer completeness bug. What's the difference, and why should you care? Well, depending on what browser you're developing on, you may have to query WebGL to find out what bugs you have. And if you don't, it can end up viciously difficult finding out where your bugs are. What I'm going to say here is true in January 2024. Things change, and these things may change. But this has been the state of things for a while. If you're OK developing in Chrome, then just keep your console open. Chrome automatically exposes frame buffer completeness errors as you encounter them, without you having to do anything. If you're using Firefox, you'll be told that you have frame buffer completeness issues, but it won't tell you what the problems are. And if you're using Safari, you'll get told nothing. No errors, no warnings, nothing. So if you can't rely on or simply don't like Chrome, what do you do? Call this function. It will return a numeric constant, either frame buffer complete if things are good, or an error code if they're not. If you're building a library, you'll probably want to do this and convert these numbers into meaningful messages. Alternatively, the easiest thing to do is convert the number to a hexadecimal and look up that value in the WebGL documentation. You'll want to check the docs for both WebGL 1 and 2. I wish it were simpler than this, but it's not. And of course, your frame buffer object can be frame buffer complete and still not render at all. In fact, I'll show you an important example of that in a minute. In the last video, I said that the draw buffers method could be a bit confusing. Here's why. This isn't how it appears in the documentation, but this is how I want you to memorize calling draw buffers. What this method is doing is telling WebGL which of your fragment shader outputs you want drawn to the frame buffer object and which can be ignored. This exact statement here says we want all of them drawn. For this to work, all of these color attachments must have matching fragment shader outputs at the same location. So color attachment 0 here means that there's a fragment shader output at location equals 0, and so on. The list must start at 0, and then 1, and then 2, and so on, strictly in ascending order. You can't skip any numbers. And it continues until you've run out of all possible color attachments, which is hardware dependent. If you exceed that length, you'll throw. Here's some good news. If you don't have an output at one or more of these locations, which will be most of the time, or if you don't care about capturing it, you should substitute it in the list with none. So if we don't have an output at location equals zero, or if we don't care about it, we put none in its place here. Here's some more good news. WebGL allows us to truncate all trailing nones. So if you only have two fragment shader outputs at location 0 and 1, you can write it like this. If you have outputs at only 1 and 4, this is fine as long as you remember to write none where attachments 0, 2, and 3 would have gone. And here's some last good news. If your fragment shader only has a single output, your job is much, much easier. To begin with, you don't have to specify an output location in your fragment shader, since that will be assigned a location of zero automatically. Not only that, but when you create a new frame buffer object, it comes configured automatically like this. So you don't have to call draw buffers at all. It's like WebGL called it for you already. Here's an important question. How long can this list grow? Well, like I said, it's hardware dependent. So if you need to know, you can look it up like this. 
If I remember correctly, WebGL 2 requires at least four color attachments, so that's your guaranteed minimum. Eight is extremely common. I can't say how accurate this is, but 95% of modern devices may support eight, but check to be sure or aim low. When allocating memory for your texture color attachments, you need to provide a sized internal format. As with so many other things, this will vary by hardware, but here's a list of formats that can almost always be used in your programs. That's a lot to choose from, so how do you choose? Start in the fragment shader. Imagine that we have these outputs. We have an iVec2. We've not used this before, but that i means that it contains only signed ints, and the 2 means that each fragment will export two of them. This is a uvec4. Obviously, the u means it's for unsigned ints, and the 4 means that we have four of them per fragment. This is an int scalar. There's only one per fragment. We could fold this in with the iVec2 above, but for educational purposes, let's keep it on its own. And last, there's a VEC4. Maybe this wasn't obvious until now, but data types that start with VEC are always for floats. So here we have four floats per fragment. This all makes sense, I hope. Now, the storage formats. For our iVEC2, it's for signed ints, so right away we can focus in just on the ones that end with i, since i is for signed int. We want to store two values per fragment, so we need enough storage for that. RGBA has room for four, so we could use that, but that would be wasting space and performance. Instead, let's just go with RG. That has room for two values. And last, you have to pick a precision. One thing to keep in mind here is that if your fragment shader output has medium P precision, then using anything wider than a 16-bit storage type is a waste of memory. So really reserve 32-bit stores for high precision outputs. So in this case, maybe we'd pick RG16i. That would work for a medium P iVac2. For our UVac4, same thing. We focus in on formats that end with UI for unsigned int. We need four of them, so our only choice is RGBA. And for precision, in this example, maybe we could get away with eight bits of precision. This will cover values between 0 and 255, so RGBA 8 UI. For our int scalar, we need a format ending with I again, and we have a single value, so we pick R. And maybe this time we need a lot of precision, so we'll pick 32, so R 32 I. Great. And of course, VEC4. That one's easy, right? Just pick one of the formats ending with F, right? Those are true floating point storage types, so use one of those, right? I mean, right? Yeah, okay, sure. Why not? But uh, see, by default, WebGL does not support floating point textures. Yeah, that's, that's what I said. By default, WebGL does not support floating point textures. If you load this extension, you can use them. It is extremely widely supported, apparently almost 100%, but not exactly 100%. Plus, there may be a very slight performance penalty going with the storage type, so even if sometimes these are your only choice, they shouldn't always be your first choice. What's the alternative? Well, we used one in the last video, RGBA 8. See all the ones here that end with the number but not i, ui, or f? They belong to this family. In WebGL documentation, they are what's referred to as normalized integers. RGBA 8 uses 8 bits of precision to encode all possible floating point values to between 0 and 1. 0 stays at 0, 1 becomes 255, 0.5 becomes 128, and so on. And anything outside that range gets clamped. All of these work the same way. They differ from each other only by how many values they encode at once and how much precision each value gets. This saves a lot of space, but the precision is awful. If you need just a little more precision than just 1 and 256, you can use formats like RGB10A2. Now, the first three values are allowed 10 bits of precision, or 1024 different values. You pay a price with that last component, which now gets just two bits. On the other hand, if you can live with even less precision, 
and want smaller buffers or faster performance, you might try RGB5A1 or RGB565. But if you need greater precision, or if you need to preserve values less than 0 or more than 1, use a true floating point storage format, use math, or consider rolling your own normalized integer system and store your values using 16 or 32 bit ints. Finally, it's a good idea to bookmark any one of the WebGL or OpenGL pages that have this chart. You'll notice some of these are marked as not color renderable. If something's not marked as color renderable, it means that you cannot use this type to store your fragment shader outputs. Why they're even available, I honestly don't know. One thing that you'll notice, though, is that all three component integer types are non-color renderable. This means that if your output is an IVEC3 or a UVEC3, you have a potential problem. If you try to use a three component format like RGB16i, your program will throw. The fix is simple, though. Just use a four component RGBA format instead. The reason for this particular situation has to do with alignment, so you won't be sacrificing performance in the end anyway. When it's time to consume your textures, you're going to need a sampler. In all previous programs we've written, it's looked something like this. We call the GLSL function texture with a sampler and a UV coordinate. Same thing will happen here, but our sampler must match the storage type. Signed integer textures use samplers that start with an I, like iSampler 2D or iSampler 2D array. And unsigned integer samplers start with U, like uSampler 2D or uSampler 2D array. Also, keep in mind that texture always returns a vector of size 4. So if your fragment shader output was just an int and your texture storage format was just R8, texture will still return a vec4. So you'll need to extract that value out before you can use it. Non-float textures have one last super important wrinkle. Remember how you can sample regular image textures using nearest or linear? If you use nearest, the sampler will snap to the pixel nearest the UV coordinate. And if you use linear, it will proportionally blend the four pixels surrounding that coordinate. That's fine with floating point textures. But think for a moment what linear would mean to a grid of integers. Like, what's the value here? It can't be a fraction. So do you round it, or floor it, or truncate it? No, the solution for WebGL is this. You must snap to the closest pixel using nearest. And since that's not the default, you have to set both the magnification filter function and the minification filter function to nearest. Always. No exception. And if you don't, right now, Firefox will issue a warning, which is nice, but both Safari and Chrome will be completely and utterly silent. Remember this one, because you can absolutely expect it to happen. And last, clearing. Sometimes this isn't enough. You may want to clear one attachment, but leave the others alone. You may want to clear each individual attachment with a different, unique clear value. Or if your frame buffer object has one or more int or unsigned int textures attached, this function does nothing. In these cases, WebGL provides a separate family of functions. You drill down to a single attachment and tell WebGL the values that you want to reset to, and WebGL will use that information to clear that attachment without affecting its neighbors. This clears a floating point attachment, this an int attachment, this an unsigned int attachment, and this clears a depth and stencil attachment. Note that the syntax here is quite different. Instead of writing color attachment 0, you specify the attachment type color, depth, stencil, or depth stencil, and its output location as a number. Since depth and stencil buffers don't have an output location, you must write 0 here for them. With depth and stencil buffers, these are equivalent. Note that clear buffer fi is only used with the target depth stencil. Again, you specify 0 as the location, even though depth and stencil buffers don't have location values. Then the clear value for the depth buffer as a float, that's the f, and the stencil buffer as an int. That's the i. So that's pretty much everything that I wanted to say about frame buffer objects. Please take a quick look at the comments. If anyone spots any mistakes or thinks that there's something more to say, please make a note of it there, and I'll try to pin it if I can.
Coming up soon will be a short series of mini tutorials on certain techniques that use frame buffer objects. Again, this is the list that I hope to do right now. I'm pretty sure that the next video will be on deferred lighting, sometimes called G buffers in older books. See you then.